Um, and then, of course, you look in your own astrological chart, and you may feel you might be a candidate for a certain initiation within a life or two, or even this life, and you see how these planets are working out to help you prepare for that. The gifts of the planets. <coughs> I should have put here, I should have put, uh, I don't know if I can write anything in there, yes, can I? Can. Oop, I did, okay. Put Saturn there, because there's no such thing as the great decision without the planet Saturn, especially when the great decision is ruled by the third ray, and that is Saturn's major ray. Well, you know, I know that you've been exposed. It no. doesn't, maybe it doesn't work. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Well, well sometime well, we'll I do can, it. I can read these. Uh huh. Here. Okay. Okay. Well, it's, it's. Did it come? It's not important. It's just crucial. Because this is, <laughs> this is coming as a photo. Uh huh. Yes, a photo. Yeah. Okay. Saturn? So many people find Saturn to be a difficult planet, and it is, but it's difficult enough to make you face the things you have to face to make rapid progress. See, if you leave all those loose ends and you never take care of them, then it just weighs you down. And when you actually face the things that Saturn wants you to face, things go faster, you know. All right, that's nice to you. I'm not sure about you. Jupiter is good too. The sun is good. Look, all the planets get involved in the act. You've got all the planets operating all the time in your life. And it just depends the stage at which you find yourself, how you use those planets. Because it's definitely that you should be using the planets rather than be used by them. You know, not driven, but proactively using the energies that come to you. That's good to you. I was just trying to say <clears> that. It doesn't have to be perfect. No, you okay. have to save it because you don't have that okay. symbol what I have. Okay. So anyway, it, it doesn't say, but hopefully it will save. Now, what we have is a little bit about each initiation. Naturally, the first two initiations are the ones that are of major moment for us. Maybe if, you know, if we do things right in the Aquarian age, the third initiation will be widely presented as a possibility, especially in the age of Capricorn, which is coming after the age of Aquarius, right? If, however, it will be Aquarius sub-Capricorn. Remember, you've got a 25,000-year period of the great age of Aquarius, and all these others will be sub-ages. Now, what we enter into right now is Aquarius sub-Aquarius. So it's a very important, a resonant time for the universalizing energy of Aquarius. Okay, first initiation. So, uh, <coughs> now, in, in the Tibetan students, you, how many of you have read all of or parts of Discipleship in the New Age, Volume 1? Okay? So anyway, there you will find that he uh, was instructing some 50 students personally. And uh, out of all those 50 students, only one had not taken the first initiation. He was a third-ray soul. He was very glamored and uh, had a lot of sixth-ray, too. And the Tibetan says, you're in my group for your own protection. <laughs> yeah, it's really kind of interesting. He says, you are one of the first to recognize the value of my writing and we are not ungrateful. You know, so he, he spread it around. He had money, third ray, and he he published the books and went the book, you know, and DK protected him basically from himself. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> it, it's a quite quite a study on glamour. If you if you um, I think he was in the glamour group. Um, and uh, yeah, having a tough time of it, you know, recognizing the truth. But um, uh, you know, I'm sure that that gesture by D.K. did a lot for him, really. He came from a very influential uh, New York family that had a lot of wealth, you know, and he used it wisely to advance the teaching. Okay, so anyway, the first initiation is collected from different books. It, it is pertinent to us. 
if, if you ever think that you're beyond the first initiation, that it's not relevant anymore, remember <clears throat> that the Christ retakes the first initiation with every initiate he initiates. Retakes it. So that's a humbling factor. The first initiation corresponding to the birth hour. It's a, often ruled by, uh, by Capricorn, you know, the birth of Jesus in the manger. And there's a lot of uh, Gemini and Virgo, the long gestation period involved there. At the first initiation, this babe, the babe in Christ, babe in consciousness, starts on the pilgrimage of the path. You're not really treading the path until the path of initiation really begins. You know, especially as an aspirant, it's a now and then thing. As a disciple, you try. You try to stick on the path, you wander off, you get back. When you really start the initiation process, you're on the path, okay? The first initiation stands simply for beginning, for commencement. A certain structure of right living, thinking, and conduct has been built up. We assess ourselves. Okay? That form we call character. And that character now has to be made alive, vivified, and indwelt by your soul nature. So in other words, there's certain things we can be relied upon not to do. <laughs> Whether we're going to do everything we should do is another matter, but at least we won't do certain things that we had better not do. Okay. At the first initiation, the control of the ego, and by that we can mean the the consciousness in the causal body, which is supported by the solar angel. So that's what we can mean by ego. The control of the ego over the physical body, physical etheric, because the etheric is physical, uh, must have reached a high degree of attainment. And you see a lot of people, you know, really passionately dedicated to sports, to, to health, uh, to eating the right thing, to doing the right thing physically and all that, it's important. You know, we shouldn't forget that. We shouldn't forget it. But they, their commitment is right there on the physical etheric plane. And it's sometimes uh, a sign of this initiation. Like he says, the, um, something to this effect that the Olympics are a great initiatory rite. Just think, getting yourself in the best possible physical etheric shape under the will, it, it is an initiation to pass through that. <clears throat> The sins of the flesh, as the Christian phraseology has it, must be dominated. That doesn't mean done away with entirely, but dominated. Gluttony, drink, and licentiousness must no longer hold sway. They can erupt, but at least they don't run you. That's the important thing. <clears throat> the physical elemental will no longer find its demand just automatically obeyed. I feel like it, I want to do this, you know. No, because there's an inner source of control that prevents you from just giving in to this particular elemental, and thus it goes elemental after elemental. Okay, so uh, the physical elemental will no longer find its demands obeyed. The control must be complete and the lure departed. Whoa, that's, a, that's tough, isn't it? That's a tough statement, you know, because most people we know, the lure has not departed. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the control is not complete. And I know that of many people who claim to be second or third degree initiates, or even fourth degree initiates. But all remember this, if you claim to be an initiate, you aren't. <laughs> you know, that, because no one will ever claim, hint, infer, blah, blah, blah. Initiates don't do that. How, how often do you find the Dalai Lama talking about his initiatory status? Is he an initiate? Obviously, you know, but, but you know how it goes. Um, the ego, I'm going to give a little talk on that, but the, the lower ego grabs a hold of the initiation process and appropriates it to its own design. So we have to learn how to detach from the ego if we really want to take the real initiation. The lure departed. Boy, when I looked at this, I said, whoa, this is a tough one. A general attitude of obedience to the ego that is, obey the inner impulses of the soul. Remember, inquire the way, obey the inner impulses of the soul, pay no attention to worldly advice, and set an example. Those are the four things in a treatise on white magic. Very simple, 
but wow, you know, can we do them? Okay, um, a general attitude of obedience to the higher self, to the higher power, whatever you want to call it, must have been achieved, and the willingness to obey must be very strong. Beginning of spiritual will. Doesn't mean you're successful all the time, but you will that it shall be so. Later, we can say, not my will, Father, but thine be done, but that's more like the fourth initiation or the sixth initiation, when that's really uh, consummated. The channel between the higher and the lower is widened, and they can widen it, you know. The masters can control that. I remember them talking to Roberto Assagioli, who was obviously a third degree initiate and a very high soul. And he said, I've been talking to your master, Master K.H., and we've decided that you are sensitive enough without us further widening the channel. You know, it would just be too much. It would become a handicap. The sensitivity would become a handicap. So that's in the control of the great ones, how much they let in. Okay. The channel between the higher and lower is widened, and the obedience of the flesh practically automatic. That's a high standard, isn't it? Really. Think of all the people who claim their first degree initiates. This is a high standard. Okay. So, we'll go on. <coughs> this much can be suggested, however. At the first initiation, that of the birth of the Christ, the heart center is the one usually vivified. Now remember, the heart rules the fourth initiation, and the sacral rules the uh, second initia uh, first initiation, and you can see why. Because these all fleshly appetites have to be raised into creativity of a kind. But the heart center is the, as he says, the center, birth of the Christ in the heart. And so you really begin to feel the difference between the solar plexus and the heart at this, at this point. With the aim and view of the more effective controlling of the astral vehicle, which is then controlled at the second initiation, long process before the astral vehicle is controlled, and the rendering of greater service to humanity. Okay, so all, all of these are just like pearls, just precious pieces of advice that are needed, you know, to really understand what we're all passing through. Think of what, you know, think of this great educator, D.K., think of that, what he's given. I'm just, you know, I just... Mm. After this initiation, the initiate is taught principally the facts of the astral plane. He has to stabilize his emotional vehicle, not always so present in first-degree initiates, they're so excited and enthusiastic about this, that, and the other, and learn to work on the astral plane with the same facility and ease as he does in the physical plane at night. You know, so there are these different initiations that take place between the first and second, and you, initiate, you, you master fire, earth, air, and water, different internal initiations. <coughs> and probably a lot of us have been, you know, been through this, and, uh, you know, at night we are tested. Can I walk through a wall? Am I afraid of heights? Can I, you know, can I plunge into the water? All that different thing, you know. Do you know the opera The Magic Flute? You know, anyway, there's a point at which... Uh, Tamino and, and Tamina, he plays the flute and she follows, and they have to go through the tests of fire and water in the Egyptian mysteries. See, these are real things. Of course, they probably take place at night, you know, on the astral plane. We only know in our waking consciousness just a very little bit of what we really are going through in the wider life of our sleep. But then with continuity of consciousness, more and more comes through, if you can stand it, and more and more it comes through, and we know more and more what we're doing. So he's brought in contact with the astral devas. He learns to control the astral elementals. So Tui's taught a lot about that in the Moria Federation and all that, the difference between devas and elementals, one higher, one lower. He must function with facility on the lower subplanes. Actually, what DK, interestingly, he says, you have no business having any astral matter of the seventh or eighth, seventh or sixth subplane in your astral body. There are five, uh, seven subplanes, and in the astral body of the human being, you do not have, or should not have, matter of the seventh or sixth subplane. Well, you can understand why, because he says, the seventh subplane is the hell world of the average Christian. So you don't want that, you know. And I don't know about sixth, I suppose it's uh, quite chaotically emotional. But, you know, from the fifth on, it's possible to have those. Yeah, yeah and that he said that the, this is the... <coughs> 
planetary sexual center as well, these two lowest planes. And it consists of the, the certain devas, which are manifesting for human beings because of the division of sexes, what happened in Lemurian time in order to hasten our mental development. That's why we were divided into two sexes. But those devas, which has the urge, sexual urge, or impulse are behind the uh, sexual impulse are so dangerous for human beings that we actually cannot hold that. We, can, we don't know how to function. He, say, he says basically, okay, with the seventh ray AIDS, there's a huge increase in sexuality, but in terms of sexual pathology, it's ruled by the sixth ray see, and, the, and the astral plane. So there's a difference between, you know, the, the kind of interest and emphasis and the kind of crazy things you get into with your thought. He calls Christianity uh, under Scorpio an irrational religion because it so much suppresses the sexual urge, you know, under Scorpio in the sixth ray. Mm -hmm. Okay, so anyway, uh, he must function with the facility on the lower subplanes and the value and quality of his work on the physical plane becomes of increased worth because his desires are now higher. He's an aspirant and he can see what is more needed, he passes at this initiation out of the hall of learning into the hall of wisdom, which means he's working in pedals seven, eight, and nine, but especially pedal number seven, as um, we would say pedal number five has fully unfolded. He's working a little bit in pedal six, but in, in, in pedals number seven, eight, and nine, the inner pedals, sacrifice pedals, those are the ones connected with initiation. So he starts working in a higher, higher manner. Um, so into the Hall of Wisdom, and you know, let us hope that we ourselves are passing out of the Hall of Learning into the Hall of Wisdom. I think, I think so, you know, and there's all different grades of the Hall of Wisdom, you know. At this time, emphasis is constantly laid on his astral development, although his mental equipment grows steadily. Interestingly enough, you say, well, I, I really developed myself astrally by the time of the second initiation. The only thing is, to take the second initiation, you have to, what's it called, uh, mental illumination and spiritual intelligence. Mm -hmm. You have to have those things. Probably easier for some rays than for others. That the whole science of what it takes, the different rays, to pass through the different initiations is not yet developed. D.K. hints at it, he says it's a lot easier for third and fifth ray souls to pass through the second initiation than it is for others because they're basically not emotional in the same way. Mm. So, you know, um, it, it's very interesting, our rays and our initiations and what it takes from us to do that. There is one funny story, because all the initiations, <coughs> what we are uh, reading, they are the basic ideas. Every single initiation, uh, which is related to certain person, <coughs> have the, it, their own aspects. <laughs> there is lovely story, but I don't remember what was the name of that person, but uh, it, it obviously is telling some kind of Sagittarian type. So he goes to the world and, and singing and uh, trumpets are uh, well, sounding yeah. and, and, um, and he has all kinds of obstacles and always he is rising with happiness. <laughs> And the gods are looking at him in the heaven, and they are totally confused. What is about this person that he is never getting upset? So then in the end, he is coming from the world tour. <laughs> he does not have the horse. He does her, his arm is totally gone. His hair is pulled out, and he is full of uh, bruises and, and wounds, but he is still so happy. And then uh, one of the gods says, I don't know what we should be doing about him, but certainly he has been proving about the spirit, the rising spirit. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. So, wonderful, wonderful. It is an incentive, <laughs> no matter what you go through. I mean, DK says, um, this is one of those great sentences, depression is selfishness. Hmm. Okay. You know what I mean? You almost feel justified falling into depression, you know. But he says, "This is so wise." Ponder on this. Yes. <laughs> I've been so pondering on it for years. I haven't quite made it yet, but I, I, <laughs> I 
feel I earn my depressions, you know, daily. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so many lives may intervene between the first initiation and the second, or may not. He, he did, there's one place where he does seem to say, whether in the next life or the one after, you know, just a couple, three. And other times he seems to hint at 20, 25. It all, it's, the time equation is in our hands. That's what we don't get, you know. A long period of many incarnations may elapse before the control of the astral body is perfected. And any one of us could ask, is the control of the astral body perfected in us, okay? And the initiate is ready for the next step. The analogy is kept in an interesting way in the New Testament in the life of the initiate Jesus. Many years elapsed before the birth and baptism, between the birth and the baptism, but the remaining three steps were taken in three years. Yeah, that's the fast path. But up to the second initiation, then you enter the stream at the second initiation, as Lufaski calls it, uh, in the secret of the golden flower. She, you know, and, and, you, and, and then the current is taking you. The current. You see, you've earned the right to enter the stream, and it's not just your own power. It's also the current that leads towards the ashram that takes you along. <laughs> so the remaining steps, three years. Once the second initiation, and this is one of the Amazing sentences. Once the second initiation is taken, the progress will be rapid. And the third and fourth following probably in the same life or the succeeding. Like everybody I talk to, oh, well, that can't be, no, no, that can't be. You know. They say, oh, no, 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 that's not what I know. Here. No. But the Master said it, okay. So at least one has to ponder it. Amazing, isn't it? That means, you know, if you think you're pushing the second initiation, immediate opportunity lies ahead. Okay. The application of the rod of initiation at the first of initiations is by the, by the bodhisattva, enables the initiate to control and utilize the force of the lower self, the true sanctified energy of the personality in service. Personality is not running the show, it's not running away with the show, especially you're rightly motivated and your physical body is pure enough to carry these things through. All right. <clears throat> of course, you know, your mind, the mind can be the slayer of the real, and there's a big fight at the third initiation between the lower mind and the higher mind. Okay, initiation one, the birth. Freedom from the control of the physical body and its appetites. Switching here to it's a wonderful page, page 685. He gives all the nine initiations and what you achieve in essence. Okay, so we've pulled these out for you. All right, um, any questions on that brief summary of the first initiation? Not so easy as people think, right? Oh, it's just the first initiation, right? Not so easy. Quite demanding, really. Entering the Hall of Wisdom. Opening up that seventh petal, you know, selflessness. They're called the sacrifice petals of the mental plane. No initiation without sacrifice. It's just, uh, it's an adage. It's, it is what it is. Uh, it means to make sacred, but, but from another perspective, it means having the wisdom to give up the lesser towards which there is attraction for something that is realized as greater. You see, and uh, how, you know, are we really willing to let go of those things? We, we think we really love them, but another part of ourselves gives an illuminating vision that this is even more important. So it's, it's the relinquishing of the lesser for the greater and always in the cause of the plan. He, now, I'll tell you what, you go into... Uh, esoteric uh, psychology volume 2 and he has the seven laws of the soul and he's got about 30 or 40 pages on the law of sacrifice it's perfect it's wonderful and that's the place to go uh, to and, and you know and he, he differentiates there between the commonly sad and distressed attitude towards sacrifice and, and and the release that it brings when you really learn what is greater and what is lesser and learn how to you know, it's like a rocket you, you, when the rocket blasts off, you can't carry all the stages of the rocket all the way up. 
the heavier and lower things have to fall away so that the payload can rise. It's that way with our life. It's also one imp uh, interesting note that, for instance, um, uh, it is said in animal kingdom and let's say in the, uh, with dogs, uh, when it is um, uh, seen that the, uh, the dog is ready to be incarnated as a human, is that the dogs will sacrifice themselves for the master, for their owner, yeah, for yeah, instance. Yeah, very interesting how that yeah. really works out. And, and you know those touching, yes, those touching uh, stories, stories about the, how the, uh, they, they have sacrificed, jump into the cold water, maybe losing the their fire, lives. They run into the fire, they put right. someone up. That's one of the great stories about DK, how he ran into a fiery house and saved Master Kuhumi's children and died himself in the process, but he saved his children. Right. But that's not the kind of thing that is forgotten. That's in the lives of Alcyon. You know, it may be rather a personal thing about the last 50 lives of Krishnamurti, but rather interesting. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it does, the figures show up, HPB, DK, um, Master KH, the Christ shows up, and also some bad guy. They call him Scorpio. And he shows up too. And I don't know who he is, but he's always causing trouble. Um, and you see how they, how they rose step by step in what they, what they did. And it's always with sacrifice that we rise. How can, uh, how can we avoid that? Anyway, second initiation. I think we have time for that tonight. You can take two tonight. All right. <clears throat> the second initiation forms the crisis in the control of the astral body. Always crisis. It could go either way. See what I mean? And look, just because you take the second initiation doesn't mean you're home free. You know, people like Hitler and uh, some of those guys, they were really interested in purification of the second initiation. Well, they distorted it. They warped it. They, you know, did all kinds of things with it. But they were relatively high on the scale. It's just that they veered off on the path of selfishness. Purification, I mean, Hitler was a vegetarian. You know, think about that. Why? You see, he, he, and he derided people for eating uh, soup. He called it corpse tea. I mean, you know, he, he had purification. And he wanted to purify the German race or whatever. Pur purity, but it was all twisted, see. He was at that stage, and he just couldn't... He didn't get the love energy into it, except for his dog, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, the control of the astral body. Just as the, at the first initiation, the control of the dense physical has been demonstrated, so here the control of the astral is similarly demonstrated. Not the suppression of the astral while it's, you know, bubbling up and all that, but actual tranquilization, control. Look, look at the... Uh, planets that are involved in that. We'll talk about that. Uh, from none of these planets are you going to get storms and, you know, well, maybe Venus, Jupiter, benefic planets, and Neptune. All of them with a powerful second ray. Every one of those planets. Those are the three planets controlling the uh, second initiation and the subduing of the astral body, and they have to fight against Mars and Pluto. See, because Mars and Pluto will always want to stir things up, you know. Like uh, the fanatics that we see in the world today, they have not taken the second initiation. They have these tremendous violent ideals, and they're willing to sacrifice anyone for their ideals. And DK says, you can't do that and take the second initiation. You cannot do that. <coughs> the sacrifice and death of desire has been the goal of endeavor. What kind of desire? Basimori says, you never get rid of it. And in, from a cosmic point of view, you never do. But it's the desire for the lower things that the Buddha warned against. If you desire the 18 lower subplanes, if you desire the outer world of Maya, you're in trouble because you'll just be attached to it and you'll never be able to free yourself. So the lower desire is, uh, is cast away. Desire itself has been dominated by the ego. That's you on the higher mental plane. And only that is longed for. That's Neptune. You know, what are you longing for? which is for the good of the whole and in line with the will of the ego and of the master. Pretty high, right? What are your desires? If you want to know where a person is, ask them what they want. That's it. What are the five things you want most? 
chocolate. That's it. That's a sign of a very high initiation. There is a planet just called chocolate, I'm sure. Do <laughs> you ever see that movie like Water for Chocolate or what was it? Oh, yeah. And there was another one with um, chocolate. 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 chocolate, yeah, <laughs> with this marvelous actor oh my God. surrounded by the chocolate, falling into the chocolate, you know. This is the picture of temptation, I suspect, and he succumbed thoroughly. Okay. So all that is longed for is that which is for the good of the whole. The astral elemental is controlled. The emotional body becomes pure. And you, if you read a treatise on white magic, you see how much trouble the astral elemental can cause. I mean, you know, it can, it can be your undoing. It can be your death. The Agni Syrians can drown you. You know, you can die as the magician. So it really has to, it, and it's the strongest. We live in an astral buddhic solar system. That means that we're mostly devic lives in this solar system, and it's the astral body of the solar logos that is receiving the most attention. And right here on our planet, we have not controlled the planetary astral body. And so the same for all of us. That's the problem. So, you know, in other words, on our planet, our, our planetary logos is an initiate of what degree? Cosmically? Cosmic fire, page 384. One. <laughs> Only the first degree. He's a first degree initiate. He has not controlled his astral body. And hence we get the, you know, we're part of it. Now on the other hand, our solar logos has taken the second initiation and is working on cosmic mind, control of the cosmic mind. And all of that affects us, absolutely. So, at this time the ego grips, that's Vulcan, grip grips afresh the two lower vehicles and bends them to his will. That's the blacksmith. That's Vulcan at work in your inner parts, bending you, heating you up, cooling you down, bending you into the right shape. That's Vulcan at work. The aspiration and longing to serve, to love, <coughs> and to progress becomes so strong that rapid development is usually to be seen. You can drift around between the first and the second initiation, but at the second initiation you really set your sights, Mars is involved in that, you really aspire. This accounts for the fact that this initiation and the third frequently, though not invariably, follow each other in one single life. He's certainly giving us a big incentive, isn't he? He's certainly saying, you can do this. Basically, in the page 84 and 85, he said two, three, and four in one life. Now he's saying three and four in one life. Now most people think, well, I can't really, I, I'm too tired. You know, I can't. Uh, you know, you practice this, they say, one lifetime. Well, there it is. I guess you have to practice well. You have to know what you're doing. And the more sacrifice, the faster you go. One, one thing that um, Massimoria said in his books, he said this, and you know we can take it in a couple of different ways. Martyrdom is the fastest path. Sixth ray, first ray attitude, right? Now a lot of people are doing that. Ignorant, but doing that. You never know. There could be some gain, except the reward in heaven is all too tangible. That's the problem. All right, at this period of the world's history, such stimulus has been given to evolution that aspiring souls, sen sensing the dire and crying need of humanity, are sacrificing all in order to meet that need. That's a very big statement. You know, which one of us can say we're sacrificing all to meet that need? I can't say that. <clears throat> okay. After the second initiation, oh, that was fast. All right, after the second initiation, should the ordinary course be followed, which again, it might not, okay, the throat center is vivified. Remember, spiritual intelligence and mental illumination. Right, throat center is vivified. And don't forget, like Alice Bailey, you know, she was probably born a second degree initiate. She probably took the third degree in her life. Because she was certainly some fiery preacher of Christianity in the beginning. 
Later she changed her tune. <laughs> but you can see the second and sixth ray really operating there. This causes a capacity to turn to account the ma uh, in the master's service and for the helping of man, the attainments of the lower mind. So in the second degree, there's a lot of intelligence, mental illumination, spiritual intelligence. Okay. It imparts the ability to give forth and utter that which is helpful, possibly in the spoken word, but surely in service of some kind. So serving is very much involved, new group of world servers, mostly the true new group of world servers, we can say, well, we all serve, but the true new group of world servers, second degree initiatives, under Taurus and the fourth ray. It's not so easy to, you know, be a man and woman of goodwill, no problem. I help here, I help there. But to be a true member of the new group of world servers, second degree. Okay, and then some higher still. <coughs> a vision is accorded of the world's need. There's Taurus, the vision. And a further portion of the plan is shown. Now, you know, if any one of us was asked, what is the divine plan? Well, we try to say what it is, but we know it's just a little circle in what the plan really is. And each one of us gets better and better at learning what the divine plan is. The work then to be done prior to the taking of the third initiation is the complete submerging of the personal point of view in the need of the whole. That's pretty demanding, isn't it? He said, okay, look, you want to uh, express your soul, do you? That's great, but you won't be able to be part of those who are preparing for the reappearance of the Christ. Express your soul, but that's not what the people preparing for the reappearance of the Christ are doing. They are submerging all of their even individual wishes and higher thoughts to that great objective, the plan, which is the reappearance of the Christ. Okay, so, so we could ponder on that. What would it take? Complete submerging of the personal point of view in the need of the whole. Uh, you could ponder a year on that or more. You could ponder the rest of your life on that. It entails the complete domination of the concrete mind by the ego. It just doesn't wander off and do what it wants. It is an instrument of service for the higher objective. The application of the rod of initiation at the first of initiations by the Bodhisattva enables the initiate to control and utilize the force of the lower self, the true sanctified energy of the personality in service. So this is called baptism. Baptism in the River Jordan. What is the River Jordan? Probably has a whole lot to do with the flows of energy within one's own body. Look at the labors of Hercules. He cleaned out the Algean stables under Aquarius. And that, that's a, like, although it's not a water sign, it has to do with the flowing of energy like water. So, you know, that, that is a, a second initiation kind of task. When you really, you know, cleanse every level of the personality, even the mind. Freedom from the control of the emotional nature and the, and the selfish sensitivity of the lower. You know how it is, people get very, very sensitive, but in a personal sense. Not sensitive to the needs of the larger whole, but sensitive to their own sensitivity. And okay, you're a sensitive person, but it only goes so far. That's it. That's it. That's all there is for the second initiation. Right. Just that. No. But it's third. Third. Oh, third. Oh. Well, maybe tomorrow is more for the third initiation. Maybe we've done the <coughs> initiations of the threshold. I think, I think, you know. Tomorrow will be Aries. At moon and Aries, and Aries is very important for taking the third initiation. That's my excuse for not going into that. But I mean, you know, because you've been sitting here, how much can you absorb? Any questions? I mean, you know, it's doable, isn't it? It's scientifically doable. It's been presented. It just depends how much do we want to do this, really? Mm -hmm. And do we have in ourselves a feeling of pessimism that we can't? 
Well, if we, if, if, if we do, it's of the personality. It's a combination of mind and emotion. It's not, the soul is not pessimistic. And the soul can adapt. You know, when you, uh, I remember there was this guy who was the secretary for Alice Bailey. His name was Victor Fox. And DK says, uh, you have made more progress in your life than both your soul and I thought you would. Mm. So the, the soul has its own estimation of what it thinks you can do, and so does the master. And they're very flexible. When you do more than, you might get a little more time allotment. Who knows, you know? On the other hand, if you really mess up after your 63rd year, that might be it. <laughs> so, so, so that that's the point of withdrawal, you know. Are you really so? In other words, there's enough flexibility. You have free will. You are a monad. The monad of your solar angel, although all monads are one, the monad of your solar angel is not your monad. The monad of the master is not your monad. So everybody's allowed their own individual uh, development, even though eventually it's all one development. But it takes a while before we can realize that. So, so if we do well, it is acknowledged, and and if, if, if we were given more leeway to do, look, the, he says, why are you wealthy? You've been given wealth so that you may give again. Some of the master R was fabulously wealthy. The, you know that interested the court in France quite a bit. He showed up, and you know, just this like wealth is pouring off him. He invited people to fabulous dinners, and at every place setting was a fantastic jewel for them, which unfortunately disappeared once they got it home. It was an <laughs> A-port. It was an A-port. <laughs> you see what I mean? It was a precipitation. <gasps> you know, oh, oh my God, and then suddenly it's gone. <laughs> but anyway, they were interested in that, and why, why did he have that? Because he had proven himself capable of managing that kind of he was never taken in by materialism, although he had probably the greatest control over matter of any of the masters, of current masters. So in other words, the no such thing is that matter is as divine as anything else. It just depends on how you use it. You know. <laughs> Any questions? It's a great subject, and gives a lot of incentive. And uh, you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes I waste time ever happened to you? <laughs> um, you know, I, I'd like to say to myself, I don't really waste time, but I know I do. You know? There are those moments of staring into space and what's happening. You know, I mean, I waste time. But think about it, you know, uh, time is precious. Mm -hmm. Master Morius says, what does he say? <laughs> he says, um, Whenever you, you have become less. If, well, no, this is different. <laughs> he says, if you waste your own time, it is suicide. Mm. If you waste another person's time, it is murder. Nice first ray master letting us know kind of how yeah. he looks at things. So time is of the essence. And I'm sure that if we think about all the moments we have in the day and whether we could concentrate our forces, like DK says, if you really concentrate your forces at a point of tension, you will accomplish more in just a few hours than the average person might in many years. So it's an intensification we need. And mm -hmm. sufficient intensification is initiation, right. breakthrough. Any questions? OK, so I won't hold you here till midnight. OK. We're we have to think about how much we can pour in the bowl, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. Yeah, OK, third so, initiation tomorrow. Right, so there is friends there. We say goodbye now from Phoenix <coughs> and, and uh, um, Happy that you were with us. We start tomorrow, Phoenix time, 9 uh, a.m. So whatever is that for your time zone. And we go until the, our dinner, meaning uh, if the plan is not going to be changed. Let, let's tell them what they use GMT. So, it's so it is seven like... Seven hours uh, to, GMT, to get GMT. Well, it's... Four like o'clock in the afternoon, five, GMT. 5 p.m. our time. So you can translate that this into GMTs. I cannot. Well, at, at 9 o'clock in the morning here, in the, the, the standard GMT time is 4 p.m. 
GMT. That doesn't mean, I mean, Britain is already out at 5 p.m. because they're taking the summertime. But that's, that's the GMT time, universal time. 4, 4 p.m. tomorrow, wherever you happen to be, India or Vietnam or wherever, you know. And uh, well, we start here at 9 o'clock. Nice thing about Arizona, many nice things about Arizona, is it never changes its time zone. <laughs> so you can just always know where you are. <clears throat> so if we don't have anything other uh, to inform you, let us sound one great ohm. <clears throat> Okay, sleep well. Take the first and second tonight, third tomorrow. Well, you don't know for sure because it goes in waves, you know, you just don't know. Aries tomorrow. Yes. Again, no, uh, uh, all challenges. It is uh, somehow we start to work more with our emotional body. So be aware of that. That tomorrow uh, you are gaining still more, uh, more uh, these kind of energies which are maybe uh, pulling you off from your center. But just go there and uh, breathe through. And then on Thursday we have. This It's a good time to fall asleep now, and if you wake up suddenly at 11.45 and 44 seconds, you'll know the moon has gone into Aries. Okay. So Michael, <laughs> Michael will ask. Right. Okay, well, so great. Thank you. If, if Sheila and... Uh, Sheila, Sheila, I think, uh -huh. could not end. If, if uh, Carl and Susan, you would have a little problem. But then for others, have a wonderful good night. As Michael was just a few days ago, he was battling with the dragon and killed it and cut the head. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's the average night on the inner planes. <laughs> yeah. But good that the dragon didn't eat him. <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty big I'm dragon. Okay, thank okay. you very much for today. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.